Opening segment is the Secretary of Agriculture, the Ag Commish in the state, Kent Leonhart, U.S. Marine Corps veteran. Good morning, Kent. How are you, sir? I'm fine, Rob. And hello, Matt. Hey, how are you, Commissioner? I'm doing great, thank you. Kent, uh, first and foremost, Apple Harvest Weekend is coming up here in the eastern panhandle. Are you going to be uh, in town for that? Oh, absolutely. It's one of my favorite times of the year. Uh, I'll be there for the gala on the 19th, and then um, my wife will be with me, and we'll be at the uh, coronation of the Queen on uh, Friday, and again, uh, we'll be in the Grand Feature Parade on Saturday. Very nice. Uh, When will you be getting into town? I will be getting into town on Thursday the 19th. Thursday the 19th. Well, we hope we, we give you good weather and you enjoy your stay very much. That'll be nice. Uh, I always have it, had a great time there. It's uh, one of my favorite events. Well, of course, it is the Apple Harvest Festival, and that involves apples. And I understand there is an issue in the state in regards to the harvesting of apples and getting them distributed uh, along the way here. Ken, can you tell us what the problem is? Well, about mid-July, uh, our growers started getting uh, news from their normal, and this is mostly our processing apple folks, uh, you know, those apples that don't meet the grade to get onto the uh, grocery store shelves that look real pretty to everybody uh, so that they grab them and buy them. And, you know, we started getting word that those that were going to go to, like, applesauce and apple juice and other apple products – uh, the processors who normally purchase them still had inventories in cold storage from last year. Uh, the last season, they wouldn't be buying the apples for the 2023 crop, or they were going to buy in severely, severely reduced rates. Um, and then we had some other compounds that the orchards weren't getting paid enough to uh, by the processor to cover the cost of harvest. Uh, they were offering them as low as two cents a pound. Uh, and that's 82 a bushel. I think they were trying to take advantage of our growers. Uh, you know, and crop insurance doesn't cover apples if it's not they're not purchased. Uh, the 2023 crop was a little bit ahead of normal harvest dates, and many of the growers had H2A workers already under contract, and if they don't pick the apples, they still have to pay the uh, contract 75% of the price. So with the price being so low... Uh, you know, our orchards were in uh, pretty dire straits. Uh, so that was that's that's the background of of what started happening, and we started getting word on this, and so we started contacting uh, potential other markets. Uh, but the prices were exceptionally low, and it just wasn't fitting. I also was talking to the U.S. Department of Agriculture to see if there was any ag marketing funding available and, you know, what are are their options were. Um, And some early August, uh, Senator Manchin's office got uh, word of the uh, situation and began to help facilitate some of the discussions I was having with USDA. And then what turned out to be the solution? Well, what we ended up doing was uh, I had a meeting with USDA and uh, they found some funding uh, to satisfy a strong need in the uh, food bank arena. Uh, a lot of the food banks, they don't get a lot of fresh fruits and vegetables because they're short shelf life. And a lot of times they, they weren't available. So what we ended up doing, and uh, it got a little bit complicated at first, but we were able to work through the uh, all the issues. We began getting inventory of what type of variety, when they're going to start being, when they're going to be ready, uh, and then we started finding out where these apples needed to go. Uh, I hooked up with a group that does uh, takes donations from uh, farmers of product, and then distributes. You know, if there's excess product, distributes to the uh, Feeding America food banks. So USDA recognized that there was a need in Appalachia for uh, fresh fruits and vegetables. Um, So we got funding from the USDA. It was sent to the uh, West Virginia Department of Agriculture. Uh, We came up with a program to where the apples had to go uh, to those in need. And 
and we ended up with a hundred five hundred thousand fresh apples, five hundred thousand bushels of fresh apples from West Virginia growers going to various food banks and charities. The Department of Ag was buying them through this this funding that we received from USDA and we were ensuring that they went there with needs. Now a lot of these apples aren't those they're like number twos. They don't they wouldn't get on a grocery store, but they're still good enough to eat. So we were providing people in need with fresh apples and they were getting uh and the farmers were getting paid a fair price for their product. Uh this kind of saved them this year. And we also got a contract with Peterson's out in Michigan, which is an apple processor, and 110,000 bushels of our apples are going there for processing. That's going to turn into 840,000 64-ounce jars of non-GMO healthy apple juice that's going to be able to go to the food banks. And, of course, that is shelf-stable because it's, uh, it's bottled. So we basically ended up with well over a little over six hundred thousand bushels of West Virginia apples going to feed the needy. So is this a problem that might repeat itself next year, or was this a one-off, Kent? Well, this was kind of an unusual year with a perfect storm hitting. Um, but uh, I'm going to uh, next month. I'm going to host a meeting with all the growers uh, that were involved in the processing. And we are going to talk about markets, strategies, and what's next. Uh, I am getting word that uh, folks uh, like down in Baltimore were like, they were ecstatic with the program because uh, they had never been able to get this type of product into their food banks. Uh, it's all staying locally in the region. Most of it's staying in West Virginia, by the way. Um so that's uh, that's all the, gr- the the good news. But I am going to host a meeting, and we're going to be discussing, um, you know, what we're going to do next uh, next year. Uh, you know, we have shifts in the industry, critical changes, ideas how we can stabilize the market in the future. Um, you know, because you can lose a whole apple crop in a year too. Like New York and Verm- New York was down because of frost, early frost, uh, Vermont, New Hampshire, they lost a lot of their fresh market apples. But the problem was getting our apples up to there uh, was shipping costs uh, because of the distance and the, the high price of shipping these days. Mm-hmm. So there was a lot of factors that played into this, but we're going to work with our growers and see if we can figure out how to stabilize the market and of course, we'll be talking with our congressional leaders on uh, different programs that can be used to help stabilize the market. Matt Harvey, Commissioner Leonhardt, um, we know how important that the apple industry is here in the Eastern Panhandle. What other regions have a um, a, a nice presence of apple orchards? Well, um, we are number just so everybody knows. West Virginia, I proudly say, for our small state, is number eight in apple production in the nation. So that's good on West Virginia. So that's you're right. It is extremely important to the area. But, you know, you have Virginia, you have Pennsylvania, you have Maryland uh, with some of the same uh, geography and, uh, and climate that we have. Uh, different varieties of apples grow in different areas. Uh, of course, Washington has been having a plethora of uh, apples. Uh, they, their apple growing has been extended. Michigan has it. Uh, you know, we were sending apples up to Michigan. And there's a lot of fresh-eating apple, uh, smaller orchards that sell right right off the farm uh, and locally uh, throughout the New England states. What about uh, in West Virginia? And, go ahead. What, what, oh, I'm sorry. What regions in West Virginia besides the Eastern Panhandle have, have apple orchards? Well, the Eastern Panhandle is the primary one. And then there was some orchards down in the uh, – in Monroe County uh, area, you you know, I've got apples on my farm in Montagalia County. Um, but the eastern panhandle of West Virginia seems to be the, the best climate uh, for growing apples in the state. So that's where our biggest concentrations are. I wanted to ask you um, about lanternflies. That's, they are 
kind of, uh, I, I noticed that they were in your newsletter that you recently put out. And is that something that people should still be contacting authorities when they spot a lanternfly? Uh, yes. Uh, we still want folks to contact us when they spot a lanternfly because we're trying to track exactly what's happening with the with the fly. The biggest, th- they're more of a nuisance. The biggest threat is to the grapes. Um, and so uh, grape uh, growers are uh, being very vigilant and taking care of the the bug on their farms. Uh, I, the tree of heaven is uh, an invasive tree that was the spotted lanternfly's original host in its home country <laughs> in Asia, and now we have the tree, and now we have the fly. Uh, so if you see the fly, spotted lanternfly, take a picture of it, contact uh, our bug busters, and uh, and then kill them. Well, th- <laughs> that's what I, I do. I step on them. They're everywhere up yeah, here. They're just... everywhere. But you know what happens is they bloom up, and there'll be a bunch of them, and then they they die off, and you won't see very many of them, and then they might pop up and bloom elsewhere. Um, I had one person tell me they were all over the Pittsburgh airport. A week later, I went to the airport, and I didn't see a one. Maybe they got on a plane and decided to spread someplace else in another yeah, they city. To go somewhere else. <laughs> yeah, they, uh, but they're prolific. They're spreading. The last report I had, uh, they were in eastern uh, or western by Cincinnati and Ohio. Kentucky was worried about they were going to come down into Kentucky. These things hitchhike on anything. Yeah. Logging I, trucks, trains, uh, personal vehicles. Uh, it's just, it's almost impossible to keep them from, from spreading. But it seems to be in a narrow band. They don't go any f- further north than a portion of Pennsylvania and not too much further south than Midwest Virginia. Well, they're certainly in the eastern panhandle. I can uh, yeah, but you tell got you it that, first. Oh, yeah, yeah. They're, they're, they're at my house in Shepherdstown, and then they're, they're getting pr- pretty thick in Charlestown. When I'm at my office, right. you see them all over the sidewalks and on the little trees of heaven. And, uh, mm-hmm. Yeah, USDA helped us fund uh, a planning, uh, a coordinator, spotted lantern fly uh, specialist. So we have a doctor of entomology on the staff of the Department of Agriculture who is tracking these uh, the critters and working closely with USDA and other states so we can learn how best, hopefully, to control this uh, species, what damage it's it's doing. Uh, so we're doing everything we can to stay on top of it with the help of the U.S. Department of Agriculture. Well, speaking of, of bugs, uh, I, I read that you recently attended a movie that had something to do with bugs. Yes. Yeah, I went out to uh, – I was invited by Epoch Times to be on the red carpet of a film uh, called No Farmers, No Food, Will You Eat the Bugs? And it talks about – the uh, 3030 program that uh, apparently uh, President Biden has uh, signed in as an executive order to where they wanted to have more control over uh, the waters and the farmlands in the United States. And it's talking about the realities, and it it featured uh, farmers from Holland and how they've been forced for under the guise of nitrogen reduction to reduce their herds. It talked about Sri Lanka, um, where they banned all pesticides, and Sri Lanka went from being able to have enough rice to feed their citizens to having to import rice now. Uh, it talks about you know, some of the emotional decisions that are being made in agriculture that are not actually helping uh, feed the world. And yeah, as you know, the population is going to double is projected to double in 2050, and we're going to need all techniques of agriculture to uh, make sure that we can feed the, feed the world. So I was invited down. I was very honored to be invited. It was hosted by the Texas Commissioner of Agriculture. Uh, he and I were the only two uh, commissioners of agriculture on the red carpet. We were interviewed for this film. Uh, you can go to epochtimes.com, and it might cost you four dollars to uh, watch the movie, but it's about 53 minutes. Uh, the Dutch farmers were there. There was a California farmer who's going to be affected when they remove the dams uh, in the name of the salmon going upstream. But 
Uh, the claims are they have no proof the same, and we're ever that far upstream. Man, are we, so, are we losing our minds yeah. here? I mean, does anybody with common I, sense run anything anymore? <laughs> that's why I'm, I'm st- trying to stay involved at the national level uh, to make sure that West Virginia's voice is heard and that we are uh, we bring some common sense back to the world. Jeez. Uh, we had a pretty rough summer in the eastern panhandle drought-wise. I understand that much of the rest of the state maybe not uh, so much. Uh, are you aware of any reduction in numbers or any crop difficulties other than the insect situation uh, because of summer weather, Kent? Yes, uh, we've had some reduction in the crop because of the summer weather. Um, you know, the corn heads aren't as filled out. You know, so like when the harvest, the farmer's chopping corn for this summer uh, as winter feed, uh, the heads, you know, I've actually seen them, uh, the, like the top third of the corn might not be filled out with kernels. And that's usually a sign of a uh, drought. Uh, the, the stalks aren't as tall. Uh, we didn't have any total deficit, you know, uh, decimation. Uh, we got little bits of rain here and there. Now, some farmers were hit worse than others, obviously, but, uh, you know, we're going to survive this. Uh, we did have to, uh, I did authorize some farmers to pull water out of uh, some of our uh, flood control dam because they were running out of water on their farms. And they, so they pumped water out of the uh, flood control dams that we have around the state uh, to, to water their livestock. So we had to do a few extra things that we normally don't do, but uh, we made it through. And I read um, also that there was a, a concern about a potential swine fever that could be coming to the United States. Yes, uh, we have. Uh, one of the things I did when I first took office is I hired a state, a new state veterinarian. We didn't have one uh, per se when I took office, and I got an assistant veterinarian out of Florida that had experience with emergency action planning for foreign animal disease. And I had them rework all our foreign animal diseases. Now, the swine flus uh, hit China and other countries uh, pretty bad, and it's in the Dominican Republic now. It's not in the United States. We're very worried about it coming here. We're staying in close contact with uh, uh, animal health folks at the U.S. Department of Agriculture, and we're making sure that we have emergency action plans in place. And I've got to give a shout-out, you know, and towards the uh, eastern region of the state is where our biggest poultry industry is. And we're one of two states without the most recent outbreak of avian influenza uh, in a commercial or a backyard flock. And we've done testing on well over 100,000 flocks uh, and birds uh, in the state of West Virginia, just making sure, being vigilant. So if anybody hears of any animals, birds that are feeling ill, let us know because we'll actually come out and and we'll send some animal health folks out to uh, check them and to make sure that we don't have the disease. But I feel, you know, nobody's immune from a foreign animal disease, uh, but I feel more confident now today than I did seven years ago that we can uh, contain anything that happens. Now, this would be just a threat to uh, feral and domesticated pigs and not humans. Correct. Correct. Okay. I don't, uh, I don't want to scare anybody. With these organisms, they, well, that's true. They, that's uh, true. But right now, you know, it's not something that could that's that's known right. to right jump from swine yeah, to neither humans. Neither disease. Well, I talked about the uh, swine uh, fever or the uh, um, the avian influenza are look like any threats or hazards to humans at this point in time. But again. Uh, we want to make sure it stopped because it affects our overall food supply, and it's why our egg prices went up so high last year. Jeez, I remember that. Yeah. Uh, Kent, a couple questions for you from members of our audience from Sandy Hamilton. Is there a program sure. or incentives to encourage young farmers to farm in our state? Well, the, the uh, there are uh, a lot of people that are working on that. The Food and Farm Coalition works on that. Uh there are programs through the U.S. Department of Agriculture and NRCS uh, that uh, have cost share programs to help uh, farmers uh, get started. So there are some programs out there. And then we have uh, you know, 
best place to start is with WVU or West Virginia State University Extension offices, and they'll refer you to different folks. And then we do have some planning coordinators out there in the field that will help farmers uh, get started. But you're right, we do need to work on young farmers. A.R. Emmert asks, is the spotted lanternfly, spotted lanternfly attracted to sugar maples? Uh, there's some reports of that, but I haven't gotten any uh, any definite uh that there's been any problems with the sugar maple. As you know, maple, uh, maple syrup has become a growing industry in the state of West Virginia, so we're being very vigilant on that on that front. Between eggs and the maple syrup, which implies pancakes and waffles to me, Kent, I'm starting to get hungry. You'll forgive me if yeah. my stomach growls during this interview. Al Rocek uh, says, asks about the acorn mast in this area. Ooh, yeah. Well, that's, that's something that I don't really track on that. Uh, that's more like the DNR side of things. Uh, but I noticed uh, quite a bit of acorn mast on my farm. Uh, it's pretty good. Uh, you know, there's an old farmer saying that if the mast is heavy, it's going to be a heavy winter. I've got uh, more acorns falling uh, in my backyard than I've had in years. You might have enough. a lot of snow this year. Yeah, well, I think isn't it a El Nino year? So they're predicting a El Nino, El, La Nina. It's one or the other. La Nina, yeah, uh, the, the, uh, the wet, yeah, a wet, possible. heavy snow weather. Farmers Winter. Almanac did say uh, more snow this. Uh, of course, we didn't have any last winter. Well, we, so. we we need a really, we need a tough winter to kill out these lanternflies, ticks, and well, that is the benefit bugs. of them, right? Uh, that certainly would help. Yeah, uh, Kent, what's your reelection situation? Well, I feel pretty good about it. I'll be uh, running for re-election in 2024. I hope everybody will, uh, when they go to the polls, will vote for me in the primary in May of 2024. And I feel pretty confident about it. Um, I think we've done uh, a tremendous job for my team and I. And, you know, we've got more, uh, you know, we added 200 farms to the state last year. We have 5,000, well, at the beginning of the year, National cattle numbers were down 3%. West Virginia was up 5,000 head. We've tripled the farmers' markets through deregulation and promotion in the state since I've been in office. We've got red meat production because we have new abattoirs and other people getting involved and people retaining animals to go into the, uh, the food system. So we're up well over 50% in red meat production in the state of West Virginia. We brought the state through the pandemic uh, in a lot better shape. Uh, there were some empty things on the shelves, but not as bad as our surrounding states. Because I do talk to my fellow commissioners and secretaries. So I think uh, we've done a, a pretty darn good job, and I've got a very good record uh, to run on. So uh, we wish you the best of luck, sir. To it. Yeah. <laughs> Kent, thanks so much for being a part of our program today. I appreciate the uh, the information, especially on the uh, the apples distribution here out of West Virginia. That sounds like uh, some good work was done there. Yes, I'm very proud of our team that did all the work on it, and uh, we look forward to. Uh, hopefully, we don't have to go through this next year, but we're going to be more prepared. Like if we had gotten the notice back in May or June, it would have been easier than we get the notice in July. Sure, absolutely, Kent. Thanks so much. Hey, thank you very much. Have a, Have great, a great day. Have a great day, everybody. Thank you. Ag Commissioner Kent Leonhardt, he'll be in town next weekend for the Apple Harvest Festival. Bye.